Hello. Well, Gary and I have both been in lockdown, as the rest of the country, for quite a while. But we thought, let's turn our time to something useful, something helpful. So we're doing these things that we're going to call lockdown learning, some small snippets. And today, the subject is bonding, isn't it, Gaz? Yeah, that's one of the questions that comes up on the ECA or the IET helpline quite a bit. So we're going to really try and nug it down on a couple of the key things, the things that you tend to get asked a lot when you're on the helpline. And when I was on the doing the NIC Tech Talks, bonding was without doubt the number one question that people are coming up to. It, it causes so much confusion. So we've pulled up some good questions. First question, Gaz, where does it state in the regs that gas and water installation pipes have to be bonded? And why? I mean, how, what, what about if we want to swerve it, if we don't want to do it? How, what, where, where's it laid down? Okay, well, there's two or three areas that I need to take you to there. So if I share my screen. Okay, so here I am at uh, 411.3.1.2, protective effect of potential bonding. And as we can see, in each installation, main protective bonding conductors complying with Chapter 5.4 shall connect to the main earthing terminal extraneous conductive parts. Now, we'll come back to that in a sec, so let's just follow on there. And it includes the following, water installation pipes, gas installation pipes, other installation pipe work and ducting, central heating and air conditioning systems, and any exposed metallic structural parts of the building. Now, that refers to steel stanchions because they're coming out of the ground. And one of the other things is that a lot of people go, well, okay, in the past, water pipes would have been metal, gas pipes would have been metal, but with new installations these days, we're now talking about uh, plastic pipes, so blue for water and yellow for gas. And uh, a way to address that in the 18th edition, the modern regulations come out with this new clause here, and we can tell it's new because we've got this little black bar on the side here change bar and what it states is that metallic pipes entering the building have an insulating section at their point of entry need not be connected to the protective bonding. Now it's not quite as clear as it could be I think we might see some changes in that when amendment two comes out I mean, essentially what it means is if you've got plastic pipe work coming into the building okay you do not need to main bond the gas or the water insulation pipes. Now we, we sort of said that was glorious because that really put into words simple for the regs, ridiculously simple and clear words. But there are still exceptions, aren't there? And the, the question would be, how do we absolutely be certain that something is or isn't an extraneous conductive part? Because that can be the exception, can't it? It can, and I'm going to take you to the next regulation to cover that. And I want to take you here to the extraneous conductive part definition here in part two. It is a conductive part liable to introduce a potential and that is generally earth potential and it's not forming part of the electrical installation okay so this could be a metallic pipe or a ducting from the outside and to sort of qualify your last point there it could be steel work coming out of the ground so something for a large building if you've got steel coming into the building if there were to be a fault within within that area and the part became live and you touch that metal work you would get an electric shock. So we need to bond that to get the protective echo potential zone in place. So some things are plastic coming in and some things are metal, but a lot of the questions that also come out are, I've got metal staircases, I've got these sorts of things. Yeah. How do I know? Because you might be able to reach, let's say a metal fire escape outside uh, some flats or something like that. That would be an extraneous conductive part. It would not be part of the earthing of the installation, but you might be able to reach out of a window and touch it. Again, these are all subjective and you're, you're quite right. Uh, I mean, in theory, it, it is and it isn't an extraneous conductive part, but if it's simultaneously accessible, you might want to factor that in. If you're standing outside, you're actually on the massive earth, so it's not actually introducing the potential into the building. So you've got what to- What are you leaning out the window though, Gary? Kneeling it, it, on the draining it, it, board, leaning out of the window. <laughs> these, <laughs> Come on now, I want the answer. <laughs> well, that's right. And, and I think if that were possible and feasible, then you would factor that in. And the one way of proving that you have this, um, I don't want to use the word potential, but if you have this potential to uh, touch these solar parts, it is possible to do a test. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to now share another screen with you to see that. Of course, you realise, Gary, everybody watching this is not remotely interested. They're now trying to work out what books you've got on your shelf there. 
Ah, yes. Oh, well, behind me, I have a suite of books covering you one. You can't see them now because you've shared your screen, but, but when we go back to you, let's have a conducted tour of your books. <laughs> okay, so now looking at this screen, I'm now looking at the IET's online package, Vital Source, which gives me a range of uh, guidance notes and uh, the regulations. It could have the IET code of practice on electric vehicle installation, they do pack testing. And because I'm one of the authors, I get this complimentary, which is very nice. And so I'm able to use this and I would like to show you the benefits of it. I'm now looking at guidance note eight. I was uh, updated that for the 18th day. So what I'm looking at here is a fauna. Now, not a lot of people like the maths involved here, but I sort of want to get across to the point that if I come down here and highlight these things, as a designer, you might think that if you're going to get a, a part that's become live and you want to um, be concerned about current flowing through a person to said part, okay, you can do a test. And would you want half a milliamp thrown through your body? Would you want 10 milliamps or would you want 30 milliamps? Now, I don't know about you, Dave, but I'd rather go for the I'm lower. Not on any of it, really, but I, mean, I would have thought half a milliamp is not particularly dangerous. It's half a milliamp is where you can perception, you, you can feel it, you get a tingling sensation. Mm. Nine or ten milliamps is threshold of let go. So basically, if you had sort of that value running through your body, you you would feel it and you might not be able to let go. So that would be my sort of cutoff point there. I certainly wouldn't want 30 milliamps, but you, if you have an RCD in circuit, then that might be something you want to factor in. Uh, so I want to move these figures into the formula to give out the values. Okay, so if I'm looking at The half a milliamp that's covered in this formula here because there's the 0 0.5 and I'll come back to the 10 to minus 3 in a minute the 10 milliamps is covered in this formula here then and then the 30 is covered in this formula yeah so we've got three values three formulas now I sort of want to start on this one because this is sort of generally talked about within the industry okay 10 milliamps and I'm going to use this middle formula here. Now I want to convert 10 milliamps into amps. So this is just Ohm's law. I just want to take the 230 volts and divide it by 10 milliamps. Now 10 milliamps is 0 0.01 of an amp, but they obviously scientifically we use this formula here. Okay. And if you did 230 divided by 0 0.1, you come out with a value of 23,000 ohms. Okay. Now, you will see that there's a minus 1,000 here, and people will be thinking, where the heck does that come from? That is the average resistance of the human body based on a number of tests. So you are likely to be in series with this. So if you were touching a part that had become live under fault conditions, and you were touching that, and you were in series with that, then touching an extraneous conductive part, okay, you'd want to make sure that it was getting a value of more than 22,000 ohms. So you can use your insulation resistance test instrument put one clip onto the said metallic part and then the other one on the main earthing terminal and if you've got a value of over 22,000 ohms under fault conditions you'd get less than 10 milliamps flowing through your body there which is the same uh, all right if you wanted to go much higher and think well i don't want any hardly any current i just want about not half a milliamp now half a milliamp is 0 0.0005 of an amps very very low okay we end up with a much higher value. So you'd have to have a, an insulation resistance value of greater than 459,000. These, these are good figures just to log away in your head, aren't they, really? You know, if yeah, you run that, right that. go for, if you're seeing 500k ohm, then you know you're in safe territory. If you're seeing, if you're seeing if you're, 200 If you're moving million. towards sort of 22, then you're in an area that you're thinking, well, this, is, this might not be pleasant for someone. Oh, and in that case, then you would definitely need to put a, 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 a bonding connection on to that and make sure it's safe good right. nice rule of thumb i like that guys now just thinking about this so we roll up on site maybe we're putting in just a new socket it's a simple simple installation we're not going through all this are we um funny enough the answer is yes ah. you do you do have to consider it and i'm going to take you to another definition While you're looking that up then, bear, bear in mind this bit of the question too. So would this have to be done 
at the same time, simultaneously, you know, the bonding, would it have to be done immediately with the new circuit to make sure that that thing was bonded? If your calculations told you that it needed bonding? To, to, to address the first question is if you're on site, just say adding a double socket, for example, there's a lot of people out there that will just do that job to, 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 you know, to put food on the table and sort of 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds or whatever it may be, um, may not consider or even realize that you have to take into account that the bonding arrangements and, and earthen are in place for safety reasons and therefore don't embrace it. But it is a requirement and I want to swap screens and I want to take you to regulation 132.16, which is in part one here. And it states that no addition or alteration, so the addition would be the extra socket outlet or the alteration there, temporary or permanent shall be made to an existing installation unless it has been ascertained that the rating and the condition of the existing equipment so if you felt that you wanted to add a socket outlet on there and it was going to draw an additional load of current and put uh, pressure on the equipment the cable and that you shouldn't do it unless it was altered for the circumstances there's a full stop there furthermore the earthing and bonding arrangements if necessary for the protective measure applied for that safety of that addition or alteration shall be adequate so if there is no bonding in place you have to do it before you take on on that little extra job there's going to be people out there that don't but for safety reasons it's essential that you do that and obviously that would comply with the wiring regulations but the obvious thing to do then is to carry a reel of 10 mil because you'd generally be using that wouldn't you 10 mil it, it some people that state that they would say yeah I, I fit or install 10 mil everywhere but there is a requirement to be aware of um, pen conductors and PME installations and things like that. So you are right, if you were doing domestic scenarios up to 100 amps, you could probably get away with that. But I just want to take you to another regulation, which is in part five. And it's this table here, which is the minimum cross-sectional area of the main protective bonding conductor in relation to the pen conductor of the supply. Okay, so if you've got PME installations, which a lot of domestic properties do, the incoming cable is generally less. This is for the supply pen conductor to look through. It's 35 millimetres or less. Therefore, 10 millimetres would be enough. But if you're doing work in commercial buildings and small factories and the like, and let's say the incoming cable, this is not to the distribution board, this is the incoming supply cable, would have a pen conductor of over 95 to 150, you might have to install 35 millimeter for bonding conductors. And if you've got over 150 mil, I'm going to say neutral, but on the PME supply, you would have to fit 50 mil bonding conductors. You don't need to go any higher than that. So this 10 mil works rule of thumb nicely for domestic scenarios and supplies probably up to 100 amps. But anything bigger than that, you're going to have to up the size of the bonding conductor to make hmm. sure it's Stop. safe. Um, final question on this session, Gaz, and then we'll, we'll call it a day. What about the distance? It, does it always have to be within 600 mil of the yeah. meter? Yeah, well, that's interesting. Um, and funny enough, we're, we're not far from that. And we just scroll down here to regulation 544.1.2, because um, it's in this proximity. The main protective bonding connection to any extraneous conductive part such as gas, water, or other metallic pipe work or service shall be made as near as practicable to the point of entry of that part into the premises. Okay, full stop. Where there is a meter, isolation point or union, so you could have a separating point there, the connection shall be made to the consumer's hard metal pipe work, which I think the industry is pretty much grasped these days, so don't do it on the service pipes, you do it on the installation pipework, and it has to be done before any branch pipe work. Now, the reason for that is obviously if you cut that off and you um, dispose of the other one, you may not have the, the right protection in place. There's another full stop, and look, where practicable, the connection shall be made within 600 millimeters of the meter outlet union, or at the point of entry to the building if the meter is external. So you've got a couple of options there. It doesn't always have to be within 600 millimeters. But the thing is, if you don't do it there, there's a lot of people that will turn up on site and go, oh, you haven't got main bonding in place, and you put a, a call in, or you call in someone else, and they turn up and say, well, it is, and that. So I suppose, really, for identification purposes, 
it makes it easier if the connection is within 600 millimeters but there are reasons why it might not be possible and i always state to people to put that down on the certificate to make it easier for someone to find and that would help with with these things uh, but do remember that uh, uh, earlier on in this little sort of session here we did state that if the pipe work coming into the building is plastic and uh, it's definitely not going to introduce a, an earth potential you no longer need to do the bonding so if you've got premises uh, and, and there's lots of examples that i'm aware of where people are installing main bonding and it isn't actually an extraneous conductive part so what a waste of time and money and effort so hopefully that's going to be addressed and if, if there are any changes in amendment two the wording is much clearer and we are sorted to make sure that this is not going to be a waste of time and effort you're back on guys i've stopped you sharing so i could see you <laughs> Yeah, lovely. Thank you very much. Hopefully that's been useful. We've gone through some of the more thorny issues of bonding. If there's other subjects you'd like us to deal with during this lockdown situation, then send us a message on Facebook, calling all electricians. We'll be happy to address when we go. We will indeed. And just to wrap this up, this won't have covered every scenario or every eventuality. So if there's any other questions that you do want answered, do send them in and we will uh, drill down to that particular point for them. Yep. Happy to do that. And while okay. we're uh, while we're locked down. Stay safe. We'll see you soon.